want to start with the need to innovate, and I would I would argue that the need to innovate in orthopedics is greater than it's ever been before. And why would I say that? And I, I've used a nice quote from the innovator's dilemma here, and it says, when the performance of two or more competing products has improved beyond what the market demands, then what happens is it shifts from performance to service to cost. And if you look at the right, uh, the left hand side here, you can see that cost is coming down and that's not news to anyone. Um, the, the customer environment is changing. It used to be the surgeon. Now there's a lot more complex ways of people who decide what to pay and who to pay. And we've got value chain disruption, uh, Cardinal Health buying Cordis for next to two billion. And the statement that says we are here to genericize medical devices is, I think, says there's never been more of a need to innovate. But what are the challenges in innovating? Um, if you look at the, the PMA approved medical devices, uh, I would expect in an innovation environment that this would go up and to the right. And it is going up and to the right. If you look at the, the blue line, the red line is PMA devices from orthopedic companies. It's going down, um, which suggests to me that there's a real challenge for companies who've never had to do PMAs in terms of their experience and their willingness to go and do that. Um, what are the other challenges to innovate in? Well, globalization of healthcare, I think the pricing across the globe is now far more transparent. And so to invest in innovation when perhaps there's countries and regions of the world that have lots of procedural growth, but at a price point that you don't want to play at, it, it makes it very challenging. Um, something that strikes us as, as a constant theme is the risks uh, of moving forward with new materials and innovating with new materials because for all the success stories, there's a Hylomer, there's a Poly 2, and we've got to be very well aware, aware of that. And uh, I was at the Canaccord conference this week, if anyone else was there, and uh, the, the talk was about quarter to quarter performance. It, no one was saying, tell me about your innovation pipeline that will reward us in 10 years time. And so innovation takes a long time to finally get through and register in the bottom line. So um, what's in, uh, our approach to, to these challenges, I think, is to only focus on an area where we could either say there's a true clinical benefit. If there's no clinical benefit, I don't think our company will focus on it. Or can we have the same benefits but produce it in a more economical fashion? So if we can't really say that, we are not going to focus on it because that's the world that, that we're in today. So we can see a range of uh, trauma, dental, where we, we are going to be more effective but we are going to be more costly than the solution today and we're going to have to justify that with, with data uh, and to show the value but we also have some of our places where we're more effective and we believe that compared to the, the origin cost and the effect of the comparator we are less costly. <laughs> So I'll give you one example in trauma, and that's our focus at this show uh, this week, is what do we think the problem to solve is? So uh, we reckon of the half a million procedures in the US, there's about 10% that do not have uh, and proceed to union. Um, that costs hospitals in the region of $700 million, and the, pa the cost that they pass on is $2.3 billion. So when people tell you there's not a problem to solve with metal plates and trauma, I I believe there's a $2.3 billion problem. And then what evidence do Invibio have that we can solve that problem? Well, we've drawn healing studies that shows we get 150% more callus formation at early time points. If there is a non-union or a delayed union, we have 50 times greater fatigue life, so there's less chance of device failure. And we've also got um, imaging benefits that surgeons can really see whether they're doing the correct reduction in the first place. So I think one of the, the benefits uh, or the challenges of innovation is you have to show there's a problem to solve, which I believe there is, and you've got to have some compelled evidence. And we're really in the, in the evidence building phase right now. So these are a handful of the 15 to 20 publications there's been on carbon fiber reinforced peak optima materials in trauma. And we're not there yet. We're right at the start of the innovation curve. People are starting to use it. We're getting great surgeon feedback. 
<laughs> and we've got to keep this going, but one of the reasons I was really keen to talk today and the work we've been doing with Empirical is that's one of the challenges. The other challenge is, is this quote at the top, the organizations by their very nature are designed to promote order and routine. They are not good environments for innovation. And if you look at standards, whether it's ISO, ASTM, these are not good environments for innovation. Um, those three examples there are a snippet of the challenges we've had in moving from a metal-based peak system, a uh, metal-based spinal rod system to a peak-based, from a metal femur, um, and, and the recent one in trauma where the FDA said, proved to me that a polymer nail is at least um, equivalent to the metal nail. So the standards and the, and the regulatory challenges do not help us for innovation. And I think we've got to be far more creative about how we go and tackle those problems. Invibio worked very closely with Empirical on a new product we launched at the NAS meeting last year, Peak Optima HA Enhanced. It's there specifically to respond to surgeons' desire for better bone on growth during fusion. But if I look at our approach there, we did the standard mechanical property testing, but we had to go above and beyond. We looked at the impact of sterilization, and we started to get questions that said, so tell me when surgeons actually insert these cages, tell me that you know there's not an impact problem. And then we get to the FDA who say, I'd like a functional um, cervical model. And, and these, the barriers and the challenges in proving the benefits and, and meeting the regulatory targets just keep increasing and increasing. But the outcome really was that we got our first approval in November. Um, we got no material questions, and uh, it really changed our customers' view. They, no one believed we would get the approval, and I think that's the sort of environment we're in. It's a challenging time, and we fully expect maybe by September we'll have 17 FDA submissions coming off of this one approval, so generating innovation uh, through a really collaborative approach. So hopefully I'm about 10 minutes. Um, my conclusions are the market dynamics should favor more disruptive innovation. I don't know that it's really happening yet. We're seeing more geographical expansion. We're seeing more consolidation. But eventually, we're going to have to get around to, to truly innovating. Um, material innovation has been an effective tool. Um, Cross-linked, ceramic on ceramic, peak optimum fusion. Um, it can be an effective tool in keeping reimbursement high and rewarding patients in terms of outcomes. It does take a step change in resources. Um, but by focusing on test methodologies, collaborating the way that um, Empirical and Navibio and some of the spinal device companies did with HA Enhanced is the way to de-risk it. It is the way to get your approvals eventually uh, and sort of drive towards uh, more innovation in the industry. So thank you very much. So the, the, the question was around given the challenges um, that we saw on the PME graph in orthopedics and, and if you have a new material in a new device but, but there's certain levels of evidence for both the material and the device design, how do you try and encourage the FDA to look at things and accelerate things? And I think that's a, a very good question, a very difficult task. I mean, one of the problems I think with why we don't see more PMAs is the experience required in, in even large device companies. So if I look at trauma, I talked a lot about trauma. There is one prospective randomized clinical trial that have, has been done in the history of the trauma industry, and it showed that locking plates were not superior to non-locking plates. So there's an experience gap there. Um, our kind of approach with the, the FDA has to be don't try and cut corners. I think you have to... Um, we, we sort of engaged in the pre-submission process, so before we really started our development, we asked them all the things they may be concerned about, and we answered every single one of them. And the feedback we got at NAS from them was it was the best pre-submission that they'd ever saw, because they said we had no option but to approve you, because you really ended up doing everything we asked you to do, and, it, and it's a costly exercise and a time, and a time constraint, but I, I think my advice is engage early, and, and don't try and cut the corners, do the work, yeah.